So we saw that the sea beast represents Rome and also Nero as the emperor of Rome representing Rome. In fact, verse 18 of chapter 13 here, Verse 18, which I didn't mention in the last sermon, speaks of the sea beast as having the number 666. Look at verse 18. They're talking about the first beast in verse 17, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, talking about the sea beast, the first beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding Calculate the number of the beast, talking about the first beast, for it is the number of the man, number of a man. His number is 666. The number of Nero's name does add up to 666 when you put his name in the Hebrew. Take Nero Caesar, put it in the Hebrew, follow the numerics, and it does add up to 666. In Hebrew, like in most ancient languages, each letter in an alphabet also doubled as a numeral. That's how they figure this stuff out, okay? Very common in that day. We don't do that with our alphabet, so it sounds foreign to us. It was very common for them in their day to think this way. If you take the Hebrew spelling of the name Nero Caesar and add up the corresponding letters to their numeral equivalents, Nero Caesar adds up to 666. And it's important to note, it's not 666. When you look at the Greek, because this is written in the Greek, the book of Revelation, it's not 666, it's 666, okay? Remember one of the ways they came up with Ronald Reagan was Ronald has six letters, Wilson has six letters, Reagan has six letters, 666. Okay, it's not 666, it's 666. Now the futurists try to say that this result, this Hebrew rendering of Nero Caesar, that this adding up to 666, The futurists try to say that this result is based on a misspelling of Nero Caesar in the Hebrew. In fact, I just heard this on Christian radio a few weeks ago where a preacher was saying, oh, that's based on a misspelling. But this is a myth perpetrated by the futurists. The truth is that the Hebrew spelling of Nero Caesar that we use to reach the conclusion of 666 is readily attested to. It is a minor spelling, but not a misspelling. By minor, I mean most ancient languages have words where they have two different spellings, and they're readily attested to. One's in the majority, it's used more often. The other's in the minority, it's used less often. Nevertheless, they're both viewed as legitimate spellings, not misspellings, of the word. In fact, in the New Testament itself, you have two different spellings for the word Jerusalem. And both are attested to and approved by scholars as both being legitimate. You just have different ways that it's spelled. In the Old Testament, you have the name of Elijah, spelled two different ways. It's very common within ancient languages to have two different spellings. And in this case, it is the minor spelling of Nero Caesar in the Hebrew but it is not a misspelling, as the futurists falsely claim. The truth is that the Hebrew spelling of Nero Caesar that we use to reach the conclusion of 666 is readily attested to. For example, we have a document dated right from the second year of Nero's reign himself, which was found in the Dead Sea Cave, which uses this very spelling, the one that comes to 666. Another example is that Jastro's lexicon of the Talmud, which is the premier lexicon used by Jews regarding their language, itself uses the Hebrew spelling that brings us to the conclusion of 666. Okay? So when you hear the futurists say that the conclusion is based on a misspelling of Nero Caesar, that Nero adds up to 666, remember that is a myth that they perpetrate. It's not true. 
It is not a misspelling. It is merely a minor spelling and readily approved by scholars. Nero also fits the timeline. Remember, what was written about here in the book of Revelation was to take place shortly, soon, near. The time is at hand, John said. Amen? So Nero fits the timeline as it happens soon, shortly, near, and at hand. And he also fits the number, as we just saw, with adding up to 666. He is the mouth of the sea beast, i.e., Rome, as is seen in verse 5 of chapter 13. Remember there? That this beast was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So the beast was giving a mouth. This is talking about Nero himself, who was the emperor of Rome, who persecuted the Christian church for 42 months. It started in late November 64, we know historically, and ended no later than early uh, June 68. Literally 42 months. Literally 42 months of persecution uh, when he committed suicide. and It probably ended a couple weeks before then. But within a few days of 42 months, we see also Nero fitting the whole timeline. Nero is used interchangeably with Rome itself in this passage regarding the beast since as the emperor, he embodies or represents Rome itself. Now, why did John put it in these terms? Why would he put it in the term of 666? Why would he put it in these terms where they would have to discover it in the Hebrew? And could they discover it in the Hebrew? Well, absolutely they could. I believe... Part of the reason he put it in the term where he says right here in verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. He couched it in these terms where they would discover it by using the Hebrew rendering of Nero Caesar because he was a political prisoner. If he had said anything directly against Nero himself and the authorities got this, he could find himself in a whole lot of trouble, right? Or his letter he's sending to his church people ceased and never leaving the island, perhaps, or something like that. We know that the book of Revelation is the most Hebraic book of the New Testament. All scholars attest to that. It's more Hebraic in its nature than the book of Matthew is, than the book of Hebrews is. John himself was a Jew, and there were readily Jews Uh, heavily populated within Asia Minor uh, where these letters were being sent to the seven churches, where the book of Revelation was being sent to the seven churches. In fact, uh, historians say that they made up about 15% of the population at that time, and we know that at that time the early church was still heavily Jewish in its makeup rather than Gentile in its makeup. And so they were out of readily figured it out and understood by using the Hebrew This is talking about Nero being the beast. So, there's many other proofs I could give you in that regard, but I hopefully that suffices uh, in regards to the sermon at this time. So, the sea beast represents Rome, and now as we conclude chapter 13, we encounter the land beast, who many scholars point out is the third part of the unholy trinity. The unholy trinity. What's the unholy trinity? Well, first you had the dragon, Satan himself, as we saw in chapter 12, coming out of the sky. Then at the beginning of chapter 13, we have a beast coming out of the sea, who um, we saw clearly derives his power from from Satan. And then also, now we have this third beast coming out of the land. So one out of the sky, one out of the sea, one out of the land. And this beast also derives his power from Satan himself, as we see as we go on here. So scholars refer to it as the unholy trinity. And the holy trinity, you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the unholy trinity, you have the dragon, the sea beast, the land beast. Now, who is this land beast? There have been a plethora of ideas proffered by both futurists and preterists. Even the futurists don't agree on this. Some think it's an individual. 
Others think it's a group. I've even read some who think it's a demeanor or an attitude. Uh, generally, that comes forth like a one world religion type thing. Um, and the preterists have many different views who they think. The preterists are those who believe it all has taken place by 70 A.D. They have many different views as to who this land beast is. In my situation, I really don't know. I'm going to tell you who I think it is. And this is the first part of the book of Revelation where I come to where, because you know me, I'm not going to teach something that I'm not convinced of fully myself in which I can defend fully myself. When I put something forth from the pulpit, I've done, especially when it comes to eschatology stuff, literally volumes of hours of study, and then I give you my conclusion because I know I can defend thoroughly the position I've embraced. Today I'm not saying this is who the beast, land beast is. I'm telling you this is just who I think the land beast may be, and I am open to changing on that matter. And it's the first time I've come to this. In this book, in Daniel, I came to it in a number of places, but here it's the first time in the book of Revelation. Regarding any of the futurist ideas, I dismiss them outright. All the fantastic fictions that I've read by various futurists regarding this land beast, I dismiss them outright, again, because of the fact of the context of the book of Revelation itself. It was delivered to first century Christians who were to understand these things who, with our dopey little futurist ideas nowadays, would have made no sense to them whatsoever. Not to mention the time frame was made repetitively clear at the beginning of Revelation and at the end of Revelation that what was to take place was to take place shortly, quickly, that the time was at hand, that the time was near. So I dismiss out of hand all that stuff. Look, the futurists are all agreed that much of what is talked about in the book of Daniel and what is talked about in the book of Revelation are addressing the same thing. Well, if that's what they believe, and I have no argument with that, I would agree with that statement myself. If the angel told Daniel to seal up the prophecy because it was far away, and that was at 500 years, how in the world could it now, when John is told not to seal up the prophecy. And they're talking about the same things. He's told not to seal up the prophecy because the time's at hand. And that's been 2,000 years? How can a long time be 500 years and 2,000 years be a short time? Okay, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? So on that basis alone, I reject out of hand any futurist ideas regarding the land beast. Now, when it comes to the preterist ideas regarding the land beast, they have a multiplicity of ideas that they've pointed to. There's one that I think it could be, and I will set that forth to you now. But again, I'm not hardcore on this. And we have to understand when we're looking at works of antiquity like this, there's just times where what scholars call distanciation, takes place. There's distance between when it was written and now, and there's some things we'll just never get. It's just a fact. I can point out numerous examples of that throughout Scripture, where that takes place. There's also the whole point of when you're dealing with a historical document like this, of things that took place historically, that you have the problem of, we don't know every last thing that took place in history, in time and space. And so there may be something lost to history that we don't know, so we can't fill in the blank as adequately as we would like to. So let me tell you what I think about this land beast and give you some ideas here, and you can work on it from there yourself. Let's go through verse by verse here. Verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. This description leads many scholars to believe that this beast has a religious nature to it. A religious nature to it. And I agree. It is like what Jesus spoke of when he said, wolves in sheep's clothing. They have a religious appearance to them, but they are really wolves. 
as it says here, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks as a dragon. Of course, we know the dragon is Satan himself. This beast clearly had a religious nature to it. Notice, too, in verse 12, look in verse 12, he causes people to worship the first beast. And also, verse 14, look at verse 14, he says he tell, it says he tells those on earth to make an image to the first beast. This all speaks of a religious nature to this land beast. And also, you have to look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Speaking of this same land beast, he is referred to here as a false prophet. Again, all rendering credence to the idea that this land beast is religious in nature. It says in verse 20 of chapter 19, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, Beast is talking about the first beast, the sea beast. And with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Talking about the land beast, right? If you look at it in its context. So, there's no doubt this beast clearly had a religious nature to it. So, who or what is this land beast representative of? Futurists make up remarkable fictions regarding what this beast will be like in the future. That it will be a religious figure, or some say a group, which will do all these things. But again, we repudiate such thinking based on the context of Revelation itself. What is written here was and did happen soon, and was to make sense and be relevant to the early Christians to whom it was written by John. So with all that said... Here's who I think the land beast is. I believe that this land beast represents the leadership of apostate natural Israel. The leadership of apostate natural Israel, clearly a religious group with a religious appearance. Now, before we go to verse 12, notice that this beast, too, derived his power from Satan. Remember, the dragon is Satan, and it says here in verse 11, he speaks like a dragon. This beast also derives his power from Satan himself, and the book of Revelation has already identified apostate natural Israel with Satan. Remember that back in chapter 2, verse 9, and also chapter 3, verse 9? Chapter 2, verse 9, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. There you have the apostate Israel being identified with Satan himself. And then in chapter 3, verse 9, it comes up again. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. Okay, so we have here apostate natural Israel. They clearly fit the bill as being clearly an identifiable religious group, which this beast was religious in nature, which is clearly associated with Satan himself by the book of Revelation. The beast was religious in nature, was clearly deriving his power from Satan, The leadership of apostate natural Israel were clearly identifiable as being religious, and they are also clearly identifiable in the book of Revelation itself as being of Satan. So in verse 12, let's move along here. The scripture says, And he, this beast, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Remember, we dealt with that last week, um, our last sermon out of Revelation. Remember, the first beast had a head wound, and we discussed the various views on that. And I embrace Irenaeus' view in that matter, that it's referring back to Genesis 3.15, where the first prophecy about Christ was made, that he would bruise the head, bruise the devil's head, and uh, the devil would bruise, uh, you know, his heel. Um, 
and made clear the fact that that first beast was derived from, derived his power from Satan himself, hence being the seed of the devil. And that was what was being referred to there. We saw Christianity had a huge impact upon the Roman Empire. It clearly bruised the beast's head, Rome. And then it was healed through whom? Nero coming on board and bringing apart bring about the first national persecution of Christianity. So anyways, get the sermon. We went through that very thoroughly um, in our last sermon. So anyways, verse 12 here. How does this apply to apostate natural Israel? First, when it says all, it doesn't mean all comprehensively or everything. We've dealt with this before in earth other sermons, all is dictated or limited by the contents. context. It doesn't mean that Israel did all that Rome, the first beast, did. Israel didn't meet, mint coins, for example, or build roads or tax provinces. Okay, So it doesn't mean all in a comprehensive sense. And we've talked about that in the past, you may recall. Uh, examples I've used in the past. Do we think rebellious Israel sinned against God on literally every hill and under, quote-unquote, every green tree, as it says in Jeremiah 2.20? No, it didn't mean every exhaustively. Do we think literally every last person, the aged, infants, and firm, every last person went out to hear John the Baptist when it says, quote-unquote, all Judea went out to hear him? In Matthew 3, 5, absolutely not. It doesn't mean all, every last person comprehensively. Do we think literally every last person in the world knew the Corinthians to be followers of Christ because Paul said, quote-unquote, all men know you to be followers of Christ in 2 Corinthians 3, 2? Absolutely not. Okay, but for some reason, when it comes to the book of Revelation in certain parts, people think it's got to mean all comprehensively, exhaustively. Why? It doesn't have to. And I submit to you nine times out of ten, all and every when it's used in the Scripture isn't used in a comprehensive, exhaustive way. All right? It's just the way it is. But anyways, so that's why it could never happen until now because we have TV sets. So Jesus couldn't have returned until we created the TV set, you know, and in a little bit, we're going to talk about the mark in the head or in the hand. And see, it could have never happened until now because now we have computer chips. And um, give me a break. So anyways, how does this apply to apostate natural Israel? Verse 12, let me read it again since it's been a while since I read it. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed doesn't mean that um, he exercised all the authority in the sense of he did everything the first beast did. He exercised what authority he took in the presence, as it says there, in his presence. Any authority that the second beast took, he did through the authority of the first beast. That's what's being talked about there. It means that what the leadership of apostate natural Israel did do was done under the watchful and legal eye of Rome. And this was a fact. Rome even built a tower so they could see inside the temple yard and keep an eye on what was going on inside the Jewish temple. They even built a tunnel leading into the temple, a secret tunnel, in case there was ever trouble there so they could come right into the temple another way in case the doors were closed up and it was tried to be used as a fortress or something. The context here is clear that what they did do, apostate Israel, natural Israel, is get people to follow the first beast, namely Rome, which it says here. That was what the land beast was trying to do. It caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, to follow after him. Historians readily point to the fact that the high priest was always a puppet of the Romans, mainly to keep the people in line. 
The historian Josephus said of the high priests, quote, the government itself became an aristocracy and the high priests were entrusted with a dominion over the nation, unquote. Another historian I read said of the high priests and religious leaders, quote, in every case, their right to lead the Jewish nation rested entirely on the whim of the Romans who appointed them. Or the Herodian princes who were also puppets and in the bag with the Roman Empire for financial and political power reasons. So, this is why I think what's being talked about here when regard to the land beast is the leadership or aristocracy, the high priests, the Pharisees, the, uh, the Jewish leaders of apostate natural Israel. They are the land beast because they clearly tried to get people to follow after Rome and to stay in line with the Roman Empire. And how fitting that John brings up this beast, this land beast, in the context of the first beast, which verse 7 says makes war with the saints. Remember that was the whole context here? War was being made against the saints by the first beast. Verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Talking about Rome specifically Nero, for 42 months. How interesting that John brings up this beast in the context of the first beast who makes war with the saints. This is precisely what the apostate leadership of natural Israel did. They waged war against Christianity. And they waged this war against the church through the authority of Rome, the first beast. You have to understand that. When it's talking about him exercising the authority of the first beast, everything Rome, everything apostate natural Israel did against Christianity, against the saints, was done through the authority of the first beast. Through Rome itself. They couldn't even put Jesus to death without Rome's authority. Um, look at John 18.31, for example. The Gospel of John same author as the book of Revelation. Scripture says in John 18.31, I won't belabor this point, just to give you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And we know historically this was true. The Romans had taken away the authority of the Jews just the, years before Christ came on the scene, a few short years before Christ came on the scene, took away their authority to put anyone to death. They even need the authority of the first beast, Rome itself, to put Jesus to death. All that the Jews did to persecute the church, they did by exercising the power they had under Rome, the first beast. Why do you think the early Christians were again and again taken before Roman authorities? when the Jews were trying to persecute them. It's because they needed them in order to carry out um, a systematic persecution against the Christian church, which apostate Israel was doing. In fact, let me share with you just some verses in the book of Acts which point out just how great the war that apostate natural Israel waged against the church of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Watch what happens as we look at these verses. How the Jews wage war against the saints. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Look at chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Then the high priest rose up 
and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees. And they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Look at verses 27 through 33. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. This is the war the Jewish leadership waged upon the saints. The authority that they had to even hold these meetings, to even have these councils, was given to them by the first beast, Rome. Okay? So they were exercising Roman authority. And not only did they do this in regards to their own courts, which they were allowed to set up through Roman authority, but they also appealed to Roman authorities themselves to take care of these Christians and to persecute the saints. Um, Look at verse 40 of chapter 5. And they agreed with him, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Natural apostate Israel waged war against the saints. Look at chapter 6, verses 8 and 7. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs amongst the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Syrians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Which, praise God, God did do in 70 A.D. Amen? And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? See, the leadership... Persecuted. That's why I believe that's who the Lamb Beast is. They waged war against the saints. They fit the bill. They're religious in nature. They received their authority through Rome. Now, let's continue on here. Look at verses 51 through 60 they, of chapter 7. They put Stephen to death there, right? Look at chapter 9, verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Again, plotting here to kill Paul. Verse 29, And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed amongst the Hellenists. They were Jews. But they attempted to kill him. Um, Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Natural apostate Israel waged war on the saints. Look at chapter 13, verses 45 through 50. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have sent you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution 
against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. I submit to you that it's the leadership of apostate natural Israel that is the land beast. That's what I think. Let's look at more because it never seems to end. Look at chapter 14, verses 2 through 5. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with the rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby. Who's waging war? Who's exercising the authority of Rome to persecute the saints? Apostate, natural Israel. Um, let's go on here. Chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. Okay? Again, here's the Jews appealing to the authority of Rome to persecute the saints. Uh, chapter 18, or let's look at verse 13 of chapter 17. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Chapter 18, verses 12 and 13. Chapter 18, verse 12 and 13. When Gallio was proconsul to Cai, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. There you have it again. It's non-stop throughout this book. Chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Again, the Jews plotting, trying to kill Paul over and over again. Chapter 21, verse 11. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. I submit to you, this is the religious group that was the land beast. Apostate natural Israel. Appealing to the authority of Rome to persecute the saints. Verses 27 through 36 of chapter 21. Turn there. 27 through 36. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law in this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. All the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple. Immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked him what he, who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed him after crying out, away with him. Natural apostate Israel, waging war on the saints. Look at chapter 22. Are you getting tired? Chapter 22, verses 22 through 24. And they listened to him until this 
word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, this is what the Jews said, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. Do you see how crazy this is? Do you know this is the same thing the Jews in the nation called Israel today still do? You're not allowed to preach Jesus in Israel. And yet we have all these Christians making all these crazy claims about them being the chosen people of God. It's ludicrous. You even have them having rabbis praying at their big May Day thing coming up here on May 1st. What are you, crazy? That's how bizarre this eschatology, this popular eschatology is. You see what the writing was from the early church regarding the Jews, how they behaved. They still behave that way today. And yet you have a whole segment of Christianity that wants to make them out that they're the chosen people of God. They are not. The scriptures are clear that those who repent and believe in Christ are the chosen people of God. Whether they be Jew or Gentile makes no difference. It's have you repented and believed in Jesus. Chapter 23, verse 12. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Who said they wouldn't eat or drink until they killed Paul? Jews. Verses uh, 20 and 21 of the same chapter says, And he said, quote, The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, Men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. I always wondered what happened to those 40 guys. You know, because Paul didn't get killed then. It's like two years later before he did get killed by Nero. And, um, yeah, you can't not eat or drink for two years and live to tell the story. Um, Chapter 24, verse 1. Now, after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. Who came down? The high priest came down. Again, the leadership of apostate, natural Israel, waging war against the saints. Verse 27 of chapter 24. But after two years, Portius Festus, succeeding Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor... It was so readily known the Jews wanted to annihilate the Christian church that this Roman official knew that this would be doing the Jews a favor to persecute Christians. Chapter 25, verses 2 through 5. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. Um, Look at verse 7. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Verse 9. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul. Verse 24. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews, the whole assembly, talking about their leadership, of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. And you have what Paul wrote himself in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 14, regarding the Jews. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins 
but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And by 70 AD, they were annihilated. Okay? The Jews waged war against Christianity, and they waged this war against the church through the authority of Rome, the first beast. They did what they did in his presence, as it says here in Revelation 13, verse 12. How interesting that John brings up this beast in the context of the first beast who makes war with the saints. This is precisely what the apostate leadership of natural Israel did. They waged war against Christianity. And they waged this war against the church through the authority of Rome, the first beast. Remember we saw earlier here in the book of Revelation that the Jews historically reported the Christians to Roman authorities for not participating in emperor worship. Remember that? Brought that out early in the book in the seven letters to the, um, to the seven churches. Things that were said there. We saw that the Jews historically, we know, reported the Christians repeatedly to Roman authorities for not participating in emperor worship. The first beast, Rome, and this second piece, apostate Israel, waged war against the saints. So, the leadership of apostate Israel is of a religious nature, no doubt. They are clearly identified with Satan, speaking like a dragon. They exercise authority to wage war against the saints through the first beast, through his authority, as the scriptures say, in his presence. Because the saints refuse to worship the first beast. No emperor worship for the Christians. Now in verse 13, it goes on and says of this land beast that he performs great signs. So that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Jesus referred to such things in his Mount Olivet Discourse. Remember that? Which we're saying... Um, is, in, is talking about the same two events. Even the futurists say that. What's talked about in Mount Alva Discourse is talking about what's talking about in Revelation. It's just future to come, whereas we're saying it's already taken place. Turn with me to Matthew 24, verse 24. It says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. You may recall in my sermon on Luke chapter 13, which covers the Mount Olivet Discourse, I referred to several historical proofs that, in fact, many false Christs and false, false prophets had already arisen by the 60s A.D. The historians of that day wrote and spoke of the false Christs and false prophets that had already arisen by 60 A.D. You can get that sermon if you want to refresh your memory. Here John speaks of such signs by this beast itself, which I'm saying is apostate natural Israel. I know of no incidences where fire actually came down from heaven regarding apostate natural Israel in this time frame, but perhaps that is a reference to the falseness of the beast's great signs being compared in a way to Elijah's true calling down fire while confronting the prophets of Baal. So yes, I find this verse problematic. I find this verse difficult in regards to what I think about this land beast. Whatever this may be referring to, the goal was to deceive. That was the goal of these great signs, because it goes on and says in verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, talking about the first beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. The goal of the great sign was to seduce people into worshiping the beast and to make an image unto the beast. No one accuses natural Israel of idolatry, at least not the kind where one bows down to some graven image. But that is not demanded by the passage here. 
Idolatry can encompass an image that is not graven. John himself says so in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, where he says to the people he's writing to, the final thing he says to them is, keep yourselves from idols. And contextually, he was clearly talking about idols of the mind. An idol is any substitution for the creator by something created. You can make an idol out of money, out of power, out of political systems. You can even make the state an idol. This, the leadership of apostate natural Israel clearly did do in regards to waging war on the saints. They would narc on the Christians for not participating in emperor worship, and they exercised the authority of the first beast in order to wage war against the saints, to persecute Christians. This, the leadership did do of apostate natural Israel. As it goes on to say in verse 15, he was granted power to give breath, or spirit, to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. I again believe it's a political system that the image of the beast is referring to. It's not referring to some graven image at all. Nor does the context demand that it be some graven image. And this does fit with apostate natural Israel because they did persecute those who didn't worship the image of the beast. Those Christians who refused to participate in emperor worship were reported by apostate natural Israel to the Roman authorities for that. So they could be persecuted by the state itself. Even to the point of killing Christians, as it says, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. To be killed. So they were always plotting to kill the Christians and actually helped in killing Christians. Now in verses 16 and 17, it says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then, of course, we have the verse 18. Here is wisdom calculating it out who this first beast was. But it says that this land beast caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. Again, not all in the exhaustive, comprehensive sense. Now, let me make a few comments here. I reject the idea of the futurists, in fact, I rejected it long ago, that this has to be a literal mark. There is nothing that demands it to be such contextually, and there is much in Scripture to refute such an idea, including the immediate context. I know the futurists want to say we now have computer chips, they can go in your forehead and your hands. So now, for the first time in history, we have the technology where we can actually see a fulfillment of this. One thing I've talked about over and over again, and I'll continue to talk about, is the book of Revelation is written in Old Testament apocalyptic prophetic language. Symbolism reigns supreme, not literalism. So to think that you actually need a literal mark, you are hard-pressed to prove that it has to be such. I have the easier defense. I'm saying it's symbolic. Much easier on my position. In regards to the immediate context, look what verse 1 of chapter 14 says, showing a comparison. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. You think the name was literally, literally written in their foreheads? The truth of the matter is, a mark or a name written in the forehead was a sign or in the hand was a sign of ownership. Those who worship the image of the beast who go along with the Roman political system of that day, they were owned by Rome. They didn't have to have a literal mark for it to be such. And these 144,000 are owned by God. Okay, it's a symbolic mark. It's a symbolic thing, showing ownership. It doesn't have to be a literal thing. 
We know that regarding the Christians who refused to participate in emperor worship, they had economic sanctions brought against them by the Roman state for not participating in emperor worship. We know that historically. Okay? Hence, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast and the number of his name. If you didn't have that, you were in economic trouble if you didn't participate in emperor worship. So here the, the Jews were causing people to go along with the Roman political system because they would report you if you didn't participate in emperor worship. The name in the forehead is also referenced in Revelation 7.3 and in Revelation 22, verse 4. Revelation 7.3 and Revelation 22, verse 4 for your notes. Again, showing ownership. There is nothing that demands this is a literal name on their forehead. So those with the beast mark or name or number in their forehead shows ownership. They belong to the beast and his system. It is a satanic parody of the seal of God on the foreheads and hands of the righteous. Let me give you an example also out of the Old Testament. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. It says, Then he called out my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, because this is a prophecy about the judgment that was going to come upon Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Hence, it's good that we as Christians are unhappy with the evil things that are going on in our country. I know most Christians think we should just be happy and skip through the tulips and think it's all wonderful, and somehow we're just angry, sick people nasty people if we mention all the evil things that are going on in our country. Oh, you're just angry. Oh, you're hateful. That's what most Christians say and what most Christians think. Okay? Now, look who got the mark on their head from God. The ones who were actually grieved and sighed over the filthy things that were going on in the city. To the others, he said, in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill do not let your eyes spare nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. But do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Do you think this was a literal mark? Of course it wasn't. God didn't put a literal mark on these people's heads so that these... Symbolic spirit folk could run around and kill them all. It's not a literal mark. Any more than in the book of Revelation, it's a literal mark. Give me a break. The mark of the beast denotes ownership by the beast, those who have given themselves and their loyalty over to him. And the way that natural, the leadership of apostate natural Israel caused people to go along with this was their demand that the Christian church participate in emperor worship. The Jews had a religious license from the Romans, which the Christians initially enjoyed early on in their history. But then it was removed from them. And so, they were no longer a licensed religious group as the Jews were. So, the Jews could get away with not having to do emperor worship. But the Christians couldn't because they weren't recognized by the state. That's why the Jews could report them and have them persecuted. Anyways, that's who I think 
the land beast is. The leadership of apostate natural Israel. I think it's already taken place in time and space back in the 60s A.D. Let's stand up and we'll close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that we're able to look at these things which were written, some of which can be very difficult. Lord, we thank you that we've made it this far before we ran into such difficulty. And Lord, I just ask and pray that you take what I preach today and use it for good in people's hearts and minds. As we continue here in the book of Revelation, may we be led by your Spirit. May we do our study and understand things and be able to come to conclusions. May we not just write this book off because of all the fantastic stories that have been told us regarding it over the years, all of which have turned out to be false. Lord, we just ask and pray that we would be willing to dig in and try to understand your word because truly that is profitable. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise his name. You can be seated. And we're going to take communion at this time. We take communion every week at Mercy Seat, and you're invited to take it with us. As long as you're a Christian, you have repented of a faith in Christ, you can partake at the Lord's table here. You don't have to be a member of this church to do so. We ask that if you're not a Christian or not a believer, that you do not partake. The Lord's table is something for believers to observe. And we observe His table every week at Mercy Seat. We do that for a number of reasons. Uh, One, it's the tradition of the church to do so. So we follow in that pattern laid out by the early church and observe this table each week when we gather. We also do it because we need to be reminded of the great salvation that has been made available to us through Christ and His finished work at Calvary. We need to be reminded because man in all his religiosity always wants to think it's Jesus plus something I do that gives me right standing with God. This time at his table reminds us it's through Christ alone that I have right standing with God. Only two elements at his table, the fruit of the vine representing his blood, the bread representing his body, and absolutely nothing else. Amen? Signifying our sole approach to the Father is through faith in Christ. Praise his holy name. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen? We know that this represents... His blood and represents His body. It's not His literal blood and not His literal body. It's symbolic of His blood and His body. How do we know that? Well, because He was sitting there in His body when He said this. Okay? So it's meant to be taken figuratively, symbolically. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Till he comes. Praise his holy name. And that's what we do here. We proclaim his death. And as our sole approach to God is through him because of his sacrificial work at Calvary. Whether we've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years, we can always only approach God through faith in Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross in our stead so that we can have access to you, so that we can have forgiveness of our sins, be brought into right standing with you. Lord, we just ask and pray that we would think well on this great salvation and that we would tell others of it. Lord, there's many walking under the burden of sin, the yoke of sin heavy upon them all around us. Help us to remember this good news, that they can be free of it, that they can take off the yoke of sin and put on Christ's yoke, which is not heavy. Lord, I just ask and pray that each one of us here would be your faithful ambassadors this coming week 
and that we would proclaim your holy law and this great salvation to others. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Let's stand and worship him and we'll close in prayer. All praise and honor unto you, O God. We rejoice in you and thank you. We give glory to your holy name. Lord, may we serve you all our days. You are conquering in the earth. And we give praise to you. We thank you for what you're doing in the lives of men. Help us to be your ambassadors. To not go along with this present culture trying to accommodate their sin or excuse it. But may we call this nation to repentance and to faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. May we be your faithful servants in that regard, your ambassadors. God, I ask and pray that each one of us would take opportunity to do that this week. May we pass out literature, tracts, regarding your thoughts to others. May we open our mouths and just speak. And watch and see what you do in the hearts and minds of men. Glorify yourself by the power of your Holy Spirit and through our simple lives of obedience. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise his name. God bless you.